Good evening to everyone and welcome to another edition of Distilling Books with Socrates, where we chat with educators about books and research that can be used to inform professional practice. I'm Claire Springer, your host tonight and part of the School Rubric team. To view previous episodes of Distilling Books with Socrates, please visit our website at schoolrubric.com. I'm so excited about tonight's distillation with Wendy Zimmer. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you, Claire. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah. Wendy is the meta questioner at Socrates Head of School. She is also a visiting assistant professor at Texas A&M University. I would say Giggum, but I'm not quite there. And specializes in curriculum and instruction with an emphasis in literacy education. Again, welcome, Wendy. We're so happy to have you tonight. Thank you very much, Claire. Yeah. Okay. Without further ado, let's jump in. I'm excited to talk about Small Teaching by James Lane. Me too. Okay, let's start off our discussion by asking you a conversation I know many educators have had among the years on whether teaching is an art, a science, or a little bit of combination of both. What are your thoughts on that? No, that's a fantastic question. Um, and yes, this question comes up repeatedly. And from my experience, I believe that it is both. You, for teaching, you have to have that science to understand how learning occurs. So you you find best practices, great strategies to use in your classroom. Um, but the art of teaching is what allows a teacher to really modify and apply that science of learning for their students um, based on their students' needs and their classroom at the time. So I agree with you that it's a combination. Um, and in this book that we're talking about today, which is James Lang's um, First book, yes, small teaching. He's actually working on um, another edition at the moment. So it'll be interesting to see what changes that he makes. But okay. he really focuses on the science of teaching. So specifically cognitive science, which he divides into knowledge, understanding, and inspiration. And just finding activities that do increase your students' knowledge and their understanding of content. And the inspiration behind learning, which is something that we all really, really focus on. Um, and unfortunately, as educators, we, a lot of times we, we work on our art and we try to constantly, you know, just really um, hone our art of teaching and we don't have time to do the research. And so that's why I love, you know, reading books like James Lang's books, because he does the research for us. He does mm -hmm. the, um, you know, the legwork, the, the hard work of finding the research so that we can use that in our classroom. And, and to be honest, that's why I actually joined Socrates Head of School because I thought you know, at, when I was deep into K-12 trying to be a better teacher, which every day I try to be a better teacher, but when I was trying to be a better teacher, I didn't have time to do that research. But now I do, and so I can do a little part of giving back to the field that's given so much to me. And so I love this book because it gives me the science that I don't already always have. Yeah, I think you make some really great points, specifically, you know, those research-based practices. And I think about the opportunities that so many teachers have around the state and around the nation, around the country to learn those research-based just because of the environment that they're in but how many people and teachers do not have that opportunity. So this is a resource that if you're kind of stuck and feel like you need some new learning, or if you just are a learner and a grower and want to you know, find that, I think this is a great book to tap into. Thank you, Wendy, for sharing. Subscribers and viewers, before we keep digging deeper, we just want to remind everyone to click like and subscribe below to keep up to date on our latest videos and content from School Rubric and leading voices in education like Wendy herself from around the world. Are we ready for number two? Absolutely. Okay. There are a number of components that steer students toward mastery, some of which include making connections, repeated practice, and self-explanation. As educators, what are some things that we can do to create classroom environments that will help promote and facilitate students towards these goals? Absolutely. So, you know, part of what we do as educators is striving to help our students learn. How can we help our students really learn and retain the information that we give them, the content that we give them? And so for me, you know, that appearance of a traditional classroom, what, whatever that term actually means, 
looks different. I was teaching my college students today fully on Zoom because due to recent weather, um, we some of our classrooms are flooded and technology issues. So we're all on Zoom today, which is great. Um, but because that traditional classroom looks different, it's important that we have to constantly be thinking about less about the classroom space and more about how we utilize um, the tools that we have. So as teachers, I feel that we need to be lifelong learners. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know about you, Claire, but I can distinctly remember very specific teachers and very specific classrooms where I felt I learned a ton. 100%. A ton. And I would say everyone watching tonight has those in those memories and those experiences where you learn so much and it had less to do with the classroom actual physical space and more about what was happening. So as teachers, we can continually add to our toolbox and find ways for our students to make those connections and to practice the content that we're teaching and to learn how to self-explain because self-explaining is a, is a skill that often we're not taught. Yeah. Uh, there actually is, in addition to James Lang's book, one of my all time favorites that I highly recommend if, if people haven't read it, is a book by a neuroscientist named Daniel Willingham. And that book is called Why Students Don't Like School. Mm -hmm. um, and, and part of the discussion that Willingham has in this book is about the limited capacity of our working memory and how no matter what we do, we can't extend that working memory. But what we can do is we can help our students make those connections and really um, create more space in our working memory because you're having to use less space because those connections make the learning more automatic. And so part of what James Lang does in this book is he creates those small teaching activities that help students make connections and practice and self-explain, which are all methods that really do decrease what the amount of working memory that is required. And so for our students, when they can make those connections, then even more so the learning is um, enhanced and retention is enhanced because their working memory is not having to work as hard or their space for new knowledge that is coming in. I think, you know, I'm on an elementary campus, so we talk a lot about schema, even with kindergartners, you know, and what is schema and how do you build on your schema and, you know, how that turns into making inferences. And so to think about some of the strategies that we use in a kindergarten classroom and how that can transfer over, you know, K-12 and beyond is interesting to me. And I agree. And so much of what, you know, I, I, was a K-12 teacher for 13 years before, and an administrator before I moved um, to higher education at A&M. And so much of what I teach my college students who are adults mm -hmm. is a modified version of what I taught my third graders and my fifth graders, because a lot of it is still applicable. It's just the context and the way that um, the activities are delivered. And so I I love that you're teaching and you're, you're producing that with your kindergartners, because it's it's relevant at all levels. So that's fantastic. For sure. Wendy, I wanna know, one of the key understandings is that great teaching consists of really small moments that we undertake each day as educators that add up to something pretty big. Can you share with us a few examples from the book that you thought were particularly insightful? Yes. So my favorite thing about this book is the fact that James Lang has just a knack for providing activities that require little prep, and little technology, sometimes no technology, not a lot of materials, not a lot of time. And to be honest, not a lot of extra grading, which we all know as teachers, you don't have extra of any of that. You don't have extra time. You don't have extra materials. And you really think about um, when I was in K-12, there was a big focus on bell to bell, you know, utilize that time. Well, all of a sudden you'd be at the class and you know, end of class and you'd have seven minutes left and I didn't have time to pull everything out. So you'd be trying to find something to do with it seven minutes. Well, James Lang has created activities that you can easily pull out and you can easily utilize if you only have seven minutes or four minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so I could talk about a bazillion of them, but kind of three that I want to focus on quickly. Um, the first is concept maps and why I liked his conversation of concept maps so much is because I've used concept maps my entire educational career. 
as a student, as a teacher, as an admin. I used it with professional development with my teachers. Um, and we've heard they're you know, called graphic organizers or mind maps or whatever you want to call them. And the concept maps are, <laughs> exactly, concept maps are underutilized because you can use them in so many ways. You can start a lesson or you can start teaching a concept by having students either show you what they know mm -hmm. or help you clarify misconceptions because if they start to put things in where you're like, oh, okay, let me, let's figure out why you filled that piece in the way you did. Um, it can be used as a skeletal outline of notes. So as you're talking for those times where you do have more um, lecture base or more talking, which should be shorter periods of time, but it does have to happen. You do have to deliver content. Then those um, concepts maps can be used for students to fill in. So they're not just left with a blank piece of paper going, How, what do I do here? What do you want me to write down? Um, but then they're also great at the end of a unit, either for an assessment piece or for extending what you've talked about. So again, going back to your question earlier, Claire, of making connections. You know, how do you teach students to make those connections? Well, concept maps are fantastic for that. And you can also, students can do them individually, in pairs, in groups. Um, they really are fantastic. Um, and then the second piece that I liked is more of a practice than an activity. Um, Lang talks a lot about the difference between ability praise versus effort praise. Yeah. Um, and this reminds me a lot of Carol Dweck's work on mindset, who mm -hmm. I love. I yeah. love um, mindset work. But just, I know I was guilty and still am if I'm not careful of this as a teacher where a lot of times you praise effort or you praise, excuse me, you praise ability. Yeah. And it's like, oh, you know, you're such a great math student or, oh, and I remember years ago, um, there was a conversation to be careful. Like, don't make sure that you're praising students equally, which I agree with. But when we only praise ability, we're teaching students that their intelligence is fixed. Yeah. And, and that's not the message we want to be delivering. We want them to realize that it's about their effort. And I'm proud of you, but you also need to be proud of you and the work that you've put in. Um, that's kind of honestly a life skill that I thought was great that he also incorporated into the classroom. And then the third one really quickly is the use of clickers. Um, and clickers have been around for a long time. I remember it was 2007, I got my first set of like physical uh -huh. clickers in my classroom and it was a game changer. And yeah. I look back on that now and I think what, what a restriction it was to have to actually physically have a clicker. Cause I could have my students have a piece of paper that's like A on one side, B on right. the other, or there's so many apps yeah. now. Exactly, there's so many ways to do that, but it's less about the clickers. What Lang talks about is how you can have students, one activity that he pulls up that I love, is you give students a multiple choice question. Question. It can be in any content, it doesn't matter. And you allow them to pick, like enter your choice. But then before you show them the answer, you allow them time to turn and talk to a peer. Share your answer, explain why you think it's right. You hear your peer. And then when you're done, you have a chance to change your answer if you want to. You don't have to, but you can if you want to. And then the instructor provides the answer and an explanation. And just the learning that occurs with that is so strong because the students, first of all, have buy-in. They've had a, time, a chance to talk about um, their answer, to listen to a friend talk about their answer, back to that self-explanation. Like, how do you learn how to explain your thought processes. Mm -hmm. And that's just something, it's low stakes. Students realize that it's okay to take risks. It's okay to make mistakes. This is not like a very you know, formative assessment. This is you thinking it through. And so there are a bazillion more activities like this in the book, but those are things that once you have that set up, you can easily, your students in their, wherever they have, have four post-it notes that are four different colors and they put one on their desk and you have that set up and then you can pull it out anytime you have a few minutes at the end of class. So those are three that I really liked as I was reading the book. I like how you shared those three. I wanna go back to, you started talking about the last 10 minutes of class 
And I know there's a quote in the book that Lang states, yet such activities which may first find their way into your classroom as a means of filling an empty 10 minutes at the end of class or an unplanned course session have the power to produce as much or more learning than your anxiously overprepared lesson. Mm -hmm. So can you expand a little bit more on that 10 minute window that Lang talks about in his book? Absolutely. And don't you love that as a teacher when you spend hours doing something and that doesn't really work, but like the five minute thing you think of in the shower before class, like that's what works. And um, that's happened well, to me. Two many times. When you can't sleep. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And um, so from my perspective, while we can't necessarily plan for these, you know, unplanned 10 minutes or these instances that come up that um, are not in our lesson plan. I feel that we can create a classroom environment that has potential for these opportunities. Um, and, and such a classroom environment just creates space for application and extension of knowledge. Um, I have always call these teachable moments, those moments that you don't plan, you can't even, from year to year, they're completely different because it changes based upon your students and their background and their experiences and their needs. Um, but those teachable moments exist. And so an effective way to create such a space, and this is a lot of what Lang talks about in his book, is through the use of active learning. And so when I, when I give a lot of professional development to faculty or even Lately, I've been teaching PhD students how to teach because a lot of them will go off and be faculty. And um, first thing I talk about is the active learning cycle. So the active learning cycle truly is just a model that makes you think about how can I divide up my class? How can I structure the lesson so that there's a little bit of engagement? Mm -hmm. explore through activity then I have to present you know I do have to present content and whatever that looks like and then I present an opportunity for application and engagement mm -hmm. um, another approach is something that's often called the bookend approach which is kind of a similar structure but the idea is you present a little bit of content and then you have an opportunity for practice and you present more content and you have an opportunity for practice because let's be honest even my college students all of us, you know, our attention span is 10 to 15 minutes, and then we need to move on to something else. Mm -hmm. And so by structuring our classrooms using one of these two models, it doesn't really matter, um, but around active learning, mm -hmm. then these opportunities, those teachable moments are more likely to happen. Um, and these moments are much less likely, and I would even be willing to say not likely to happen if a classroom is fully lecture-based, if there's not chances for application and extension. Um, so a lot of, like I said, a lot of Lang's activities follow a similar structure to, that could be integrated into an active learning type classroom. I know you've spoke on how you've even implemented some of these um, research-based practices with your students at Texas A&M. And I know that you interact with a number of students through your teaching, as well as some articles you have published. So how do you see James, James Lang's work supporting or extending some of your thinking about teaching and research at the higher education level? Great question. Um, I actually continually strive to create more teachable moments mm -hmm. in my classroom. Every semester I conduct research on my teaching because I figure my students are the best method of feedback to know if the activities that I'm implementing are useful. Exactly. Are they useful? Are they effective? Um, are they authentic? Because am I just, does it, the students feel like I'm just throwing things in because I'm trying things that are new. Um, so using the feedback from my students, I evaluate activities that I implement. Um, and largely by reading Lang's work, the, the biggest difference that that has made on my teaching is intentionally integrating, again, what Lang calls that cognitive science. So the knowledge, the understanding and the inspiration, but realizing there's a difference. Um, mm -hmm. and I've always used Bloom's taxonomy. I know, Claire, you're familiar with Bloom's. Um, Bloom's taxonomy has been a foundation of my educational practice since I started my undergrad many years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but I used to really only focus on aligning my learning objectives with my assessments. Does everything align? Am I assessing 
you know, when I'm setting out to teach my students. But what I've done as a result of reading Lang's work is now I think about the activities that I integrate. Yes. And do my activities follow blooms and do my activities align with my learning objectives? Because before that didn't even occur to me, but now by aligning my activities, I'm really thinking about what do I want my students to do? You know, am I am I really doing a clicker type question because I'm at that knowledge base and I just want to see what they know? Or am I throwing in a concept map in the middle to kind of see those more of that creating or more of that applying to see how they're making connections to content that we've already covered. And that's changed a lot of how I teach because before, if it happened, it wasn't intentional and it was lucky. Mm -hmm. and, and now there's a lot more just focus and thought behind the activities that I put into my classroom. And it's a work in progress. Um, and I continually learn and make improvements each semester. Um, but with work, like Lang's work and then other resources, it really has improved my teaching. And I think too, getting that feedback from your students, you know, they're the best way for us to grow. And so, you know, especially at the college level because they're grown, you know, so they really can, hopefully by then they're able to communicate um, what has worked and what hasn't worked. So Wendy, we yeah. could talk all night about <laughs> teaching and books and uh, how to do better things for kids. So thank you for joining us tonight. I want Absolutely. our viewers to be able to connect with you and Socrates. So do you mind briefly just sharing how they can find you guys and your work? Absolutely. So we have a website. It's um, SocratesHeadOfSchool.com. And if you go on that website, you can see um, not only kind of a distillation of James Lang's book, but also many other books that we're working on. We're constantly reading new literature that's put up or put out and then adding it to our website. Um, and then also on that website, there's a list of all of us that are working with Socrates Head of School. And so you can see our social media, um, kind of our Twitter head headers and all of those things, um, handles, thank you, that's the word I was looking for. Um, but also you can follow Socrates Head of School on social media and we're always pushing things out that way as well. So that's the best way to get a hold of us. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you for tuning in. And remember to hit that subscribe and like button for more great content from School Rubric and distillations from Socrates Head of School. Good night, everyone. Thank you for watching School Rubric on YouTube. Make sure that you like, follow, and subscribe in order to stay looped in on all of our diverse collection of shows, interviews, panels, tutorials, and more from educators around the globe. And visit us at schoolrubric.com for even more great content such as our online articles, Interact Magazine, featured podcasts, and more. Thank you.